Hi everyone and welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Gladys Lee. I'm Brath Wang. The region's geopolitical risk remain unabated as China continues with its military buildup and growing tensions between the two Koreas. Today we will explore what risk lies ahead as Asian democracies. Democracies continue to fend off growing authoritarian influence. So today joining us in the studio, we have Wu Kaixi, a former student leader in the 1989 Tiananmen Student Democracy Movement and General Secretary of the Taiwan Parliamentary Human Rights Commission. The second guest, we have Vincent Zhao. Now he is the Taipei City Councilor and former director of the political division of TECRO, Taiwan's representative office in the U.S. Both are experts on Taiwan's international relations, particularly between Taiwan, the U.S., and China. Very welcome for the show. I spoke earlier to Yang Qianhao, Core News founder, Taiwanese correspondent based in Korea, who also reports for TVBS, PTS, and UDN Global. And I also spoke earlier to Rick Fisher, Senior Fellow on Asian Military Affairs at the International Assessment and Strategy Center. Rick is a PRC expert and an expert on Asian security and is the author of China's Military Modernization, Building for Regional and Global Reach. With Beijing's daily incursions of PLA aircraft around Taiwan and Pyongyang's launch of several ballistic missiles right before 2022 came to an end, Regional players from Japan to the U.S. remain on high alert. My first question goes to you, Ur Kaishi. North Korea continues to intrude into South Korea's airspace as the fifth consecutive year. Um, South Korea's Ministry of National Defense is investing 440 million U.S. dollars over the next five years to monitor and to deter this intrusion. How does this span in terms of Asian security? And how does this compare to China's threat on Taiwan? Basically, the world is dividing into two camps these days, mm -hmm. democracy and autocracies, uh, uh, led by U.S. and China. Um, but also in the, in, the, in the camp of the uh, autocracy, we know that they closely work together with Russia, North Korea. So, and then we also know that the U.S. work closely with South Korea. Act, act, United States have uh, the best military cooperation in the, in the world with South Korea. I mean, the uh, military cooperation, military tie between U.S. and South Korea is, uh, is uh, closer than U.S. Uh, with Canada or U.S. with U.K. or U.S. with Israel in that matter. Uh, uh, so this is the, this is, if you can see this as a, a front line between the two, camps. Uh, Korea can be as, as, as front as it can get. Uh, so this is, it is a regional politics, regional military uh, tension, but it is definitely also a part of a much bigger picture. U.S.-China standoff. We are entering this, uh, no question about it, we're entering this era, new era. This is uh, uh, U.S. versus China. And uh, uh, the flagship of uh, the flag of democracy. So, uh, uh, United States and Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan is in one camp. And then, if you threaten one, you threaten everybody. So, uh, North Korea, and then uh, uh, make no mistake, uh, uh, autocracies work together. They definitely so work. You're saying China and North Korea actually absolutely, work together absolutely. On you know, synchronizing with how they deal with the U.S. I'm pretty, I'm like a 100% certain that North Korea will not uh, pose those military threats to South without China's uh, green light. Mm -hmm. So we, we all know that, and then China giving those green lights to North Korea, in, the, in their mind, they were thinking China, U.S. They were thinking about, uh, you know, the, the closest the U.S. presence to China is in South Korea. And then... Uh, that is also the uh, strongest uh, obstacle for China's uh, expansion. And then they have every uh, ambition to expand in the region. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, you, can, you have to see all these in the, in the same you know, picture. And then you see uh, there is no difference between South Korea or Taiwan or Japan. It's one camp. Yeah, it's that, they, that actually <laughs> brings up a very good point that we see the uh, democracy countries changing their attitude. Do you see uh, any, any pictures or, or, or any forms of change recently in Asia, Vincent? Well, certainly I'll put it like this. I think it is in China's interest for North Korea to keep the U.S. preoccupied. And, you know, the launch of the new space unit 
in South Korea, um, increased um, attention over missile launches by North Korea. I think all of this plays directly into what China hopes to achieve, which is a U.S. that is distracted right. and unable to marshal the necessary resources and attention on this growing threat from across the Taiwan Strait. And so we have to look at it in the context of what North Korea has really been doing over the past year. I mean, in 2022, I think they launched 95 missile tests. And that's probably the highest number in the history, I think, of North Korea's missile tests. A certain number of them were ICBMs, so they showcased this ability to carry nuclear warheads. Now, all of this, I think, were really focused on South Korea, yes, but also on Japan secondarily, and then on the United States, like I talked about earlier. And so I do think North Korea is playing into part of that strategy, and that's something we have to be on a watch for. But I will say this, I, I will say that as we see kind of increased missile tests, as we saw the drone um, incursions that took place uh, over the past few weeks, um, North Korea flew, I think, five drones into South Korean airspace for a, a huge amount of time before they were um, intercepted or crashed or so forth. So, you know, I think all of this is really pushing, I think, this conflict to the breaking point, and, and conflict broadly as what Ward Kaishi talked about, this conflict between democracies and authoritarian actors. And so I think it is important, particularly at this critical juncture, mm -hmm. for all democracies to see themselves as part of this bigger, bigger picture. You know, it's, it's obviously in authoritarian countries' interest to pick us off one by one. Right. I think we're a lot stronger if we stand together, and I do think countries around the region have growing recognition of this. But, but do you feel there's like direct implications for Taiwan? Like going back to my first question. Certainly, uh, the yeah, and the Vincent just mentioned the space unit uh, is a, a joint force. I mean, it, and then also third deployment in uh, in uh, in South Korea. That is the uh, the one uh, the most uh, uh, forward uh, front line, not only against uh, North Korea but also against China, as as you can monitor. The military activity of China and and Russia even, so uh, uh, it will definitely have a direct benefit for Taiwan. It will become it will serve as our first line of uh, of alert when whenever we see China's military deployment. That system, uh, that space system, will let us know too. Mm -hmm. No, and then Japan will be more, uh, will be alerted, and then uh, so if there is a military aggression between. Uh, uh, North Korea is most likely first target is going to be South Korea, but that also means United States, and then Japan is also a possible possible target for North Korea. So that makes this uh, the whole region uh, a, a clear two pack, and Taiwan is definitely part of it because China would l good p chance of taking that opportunity to uh, to um, uh, making their military moves against Taiwan. Uh, uh, there are always a lot of talkings in China about this military aggression against China uh, against Taiwan, but when, maybe it doesn't serve the best political purpose for uh, uh, Chinese, let's say Xi Jinping or political st uh, standing bureau. But it will it will be uh, if if you keep talking, keep shouting those political slogans, it will get the military generals get a little you know. Edgy, and then they want to uh, they want to get their promotion through a military action. So uh, that that you will see uh, some kind of some kind of uh, military movement. What is it, is it going to be a full fledged invasion, or you know even from the North Korea to South? We don't know what it's going to be, but the tension is there, and then the our generals are edgy, and then they want to. They want to you know, want to pull that trigger, so uh, so we need to uh, monitor this closely. But I think the alliance is being formed. Right. Well, when North Korea is making their moves, the alliance on the other side, on the defense side, is being formed. But if we examine it more precisely or closely, what motives are behind this launch of the space unit from your pers perspective, Vincent? Well, well, I think I think the motive is very, very simple, which is you need to gain a greater spatial awareness of what's happening, both in North Korea, but China in general yeah, as well. And, you know, I, I do think this feeds into what Wurikaishi says, a common understanding between um, Taiwan, United States, Japan, South Korea, among common threats in the region. And, mm -hmm. and I do think increased intelligence sharing, increased, uh, you know, space imagery, increased uh, radar sharing, all of this information, I think will help stimulate a greater bond between uh, democracies as we work together. But I wanted to segue that question into, I think, an interesting analysis, which is reading into um, similarities, I think, that are growing between North Korea and China. And mm -hmm. so, you know, previously, I don't think many people attached a lot of similarities to these 
countries. I mean, their economic growth was trajectory yeah. in different directions, and politically and so forth. But I do think over the past few years under Xi Jinping um, in China, under uh, Kim Jong Il in in, um, in South Korea, uh, in North Korea, we're seeing a lot of of their politics become more personality based. And so they're more subject to, I think, their whims and desires of whoever's in power, in this case, Xi and Kim. Um, and that brings a lot of uncertainty in terms of how countries need to react. So that's the first part. The second part, we're seeing foreign affairs and particularly you know, um, foreign relations take a subservient role to domestic politics in both these countries. And that plays, I think, precisely into some of Taiwan's fears. So the reason why we're seeing North Korea engage in so much ballistic missile tests is simply because COVID is wrecking havoc on their economy. I mean, their foreign currency is tanked. I think they're trading about half of the value of what they were kind of prior to the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, the sanctions have crippled, I think, uh, imports of essential goods. And so I think North Korea really wants to buy themselves a seat kind of on the negotiation table by saying that we have nuclear warheads, we have the capability of you know, ICBMs and so forth. And so on the flip side, you know, China, I think, is a big worry for us in this respect, too, because China's economy is tanking right now yeah. because of COVID. We're seeing huge unemployment uh, by the youth of China, about 20% unemployment. We're seeing a lot of domestic struggles, uh, particularly because of these uh, restrictions we had in the past that Xi Jinping had instituted prior to the 20th uh, Party Congress. And so the worry, I think, for us is that they're going to find ways to lash out to direct national sentiment at issues that are outside their boundaries, right. such as what North Korea has done in the past. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we see North Korea, I think this really should be a lesson for Taiwan. And you know, we don't see the similarity in the past, we should see it now. And certainly I think we should find ways of looking into and learning from and also coordinating with South Korea in terms of how they're responding to threats such as what I talked about. So you feel like it will set up a precedent for the region? I very much think Or and even hope. like faster, fast, fasten the period. Yeah, I, I mean, I very much th I think and hope that, that this will be the start of something, you know, in terms of cooperation between Taiwan and South Korea and the United States and mm -hmm. Japan. But I also think and understand and, and believe that as time goes by, we'll see a greater tendency by actors such as China and such as North Korea to really to externalize their internal problems. And we'll see a greater emphasis on them engaging in bellicose rhetoric, engaging in military adventurism to try to detract away from their uh, uh, problems at home. Vincent m mentioned m military adventurism and Urkashi. We talked about that in a previous episode on how the Air Force Revolution, as you mentioned, it was an excuse for China to release or shy away from its zero COVID policy. Do you feel the economy will continue to falter, as Vincent mentioned, and in that sense, will Taiwan become the next target? Well, it's, there's certainly that possibilities, and in, uh, but also uh, for PLA to attack Taiwan. Well, uh, they want to. They want the PLA. The generals want. Uh, a war, yes, that will help their personal advancement, and uh, uh, they they can generals get promoted through war. So, uh, but for Xi Jinping, he wants to the the total aim for the only thing he has in his mind is to tighter gr uh, grip of the control of the power, and that's it. That doesn't include Taiwan. Uh, no, not necessarily. Uh, but if something else comes, for instance. Uh, so what I'm saying is like if it invades Taiwan and then serve the purpose for him to consolidate his power, he will do so. What would do what kind of a, what circumstances would trigger that? Something else happened like uh, there is a more bigger challenge within the party and then he realized everything else he tried to uh, consolidate power have failed and launching a war to Taiwan may serve that purpose and then they the, the one thing we need to know about totalitarian regime is that they don't care about human losses. They don't care about losing the, the life of their PLA soldiers or North Korean uh, uh, People's Army the soldiers. The only human loss they care about is their own. Is their yeah. own. Exactly. <laughs> like and then, achieving the target. The ones, and then with the power they have, the only thing they care is to uh, loot the country. You know, so, so that may basically make them not much different from a common thief. But um, uh, thugs, uh, but thugs do things irrationally. That's the thing that we should be most worried about. And then I think uh, oh, another thing is that thugs respond to deterring mm -hmm. well. Like uh, if we, if the, the rest of the world, if rest of the camp consolidate and send the right message to Xi Jinping and say we will respond hard when you, if you if you do crazy things, like I said, thugs do crazy things. 
then uh, then they will they will listen. They can get the message. Uh, they they are quite calculative in this. So in a way, North Korea is actually helping Taiwan in that sense because it's bringing allies together to increase deterrence of if, China. If we do come to that alliance, <laughs> that's the thing. You know, we are democracy. We have a problem of being a democratic country. Right. That the country have different voices within our own. Can we come to the uh, a conclusion? Can we come to a sense for I mean the 23 million? Taiwanese and to say yes, we are standing firmly against that uh, uh, authoritarian expansion, and then we are joining forces with our allies. If we can express that yes, that then the North Korean will serve the purpose of uh, uh, you know make united us, united you know uh, Taiwan with South Korea with Japan. Japan is strong in, in standing behind Taiwan, but South Korea have always been playing. Uh, uh, you know, they, are, they, they stand in a, in a position, they are much trickier than ours. They have a very yeah. strong direct military threat, right. and then which is not a, a water apart. It's a land, just, uh, you know, 38 parallel, and then the, the People's Army, they, they, that's what they call themselves, the, the North Korean Army. They, they can just launch an invasion like uh, Russia did to Ukraine. So they are very concerned about their relation while being a close ally, closest ally with the United States, they also don't want to, don't want uh, China. They want they don't want to upset China, and then yeah. they want China to hold the grip of North Korea. So they are in a trickier position to uh, uh, stand a stronger yeah. alliance with Taiwan. But the United States is consolidating that because U.S. is t South Korea's ally, and then it's also ours. So that kind of uh, put us in a in the same line. Vincent, you have something to add on, right? Yeah, I I, I think you know Ur Kaishi is absolutely right. Um, I mean, the rule of nas international politics is that countries generally do what's in their best interest and what's mm -hmm. consistent with their values. And I think South Korea has realized a long time ago that their interests foremost concern not getting invaded by North Korea. Exactly. Yeah. And, and if they're going to need Chinese support to achieve that interest, I think they're going to try to uh, achieve that. I mean, even President Yoon, who has generally been seen as a much more conservative leader um, compared to his predecessors, I think has been very, very careful vis-a-vis uh, yes. -vis China, because he doesn't want to stir up uh, further Chinese cooperation in North Korea. And so my point is this. My point is, I, I, I think and hope that countries do recognize that the value of standing together is greater than the value of standing alone. And for the past, I think South Korea and other countries have not had the luxury of making that decision because of this existentialist crisis that they face, but also because the structure of, I think, democratic cooperation wasn't mature enough. Okay. And I think that will become more mature as time goes by. And so I do think that as time goes by, hopefully South Korea starts to reconsider this idea that maybe standing together in a joint coalition of like-minded partners, mm -hmm. rather than just the United States, ultimately does more to defend Korea's security than otherwise. Right, right. Yeah. I think it's, that, that's very interesting to see how these North East uh, democracies, countries are going to stand in between the superpowers, the U.S. and also China. We'll come back to talk about that. So actually, we just talk about rising tensions in the Korean Peninsula and how this threat compares with China's continued military activities in Taiwan Strait. Coming up next, we hear from Yang Qianhao, Core News founder, Taiwanese correspondent based in Korea, as he speaks to Rath about Korean President Yoon Yoon Suk Yeol's increasing cooperation with the U.S. amid a rising North Korean threat. Welcome back to the show. Let's now hear from Yang Tianhao, Core News founder, Taiwanese correspondent based in Seoul, who also reports for TVBS, PTS, and UDN Global. He spoke to me about increased South Korean military cooperation with the U.S. and how President Yoon is balancing relationships between his country's largest trading partner, China and its largest security partner, the U.S. Let's take a look. I haven't seen huge move from the South Korea government these several months and since the presidential election last year till now, after uh, President Yoon has been elected, uh, he has been emphasizing that he'll strengthen the ties with the United States. And also, President Yoon want to build up a relation um, based on principles and uh, uh, mutual respect with China instead of making much concessions and always concerning or even the void of irritating China like former President Moon Jae-in did. So until now, this stance or uh, position is still the same. South Korea has already shifted to the United States after President Yoon takes power, nothing different. So I would rather say um, 
the more close South Korea shifts to the United States, the more threats and tensions North Korea will impose unless the United States and North Korea build up mutual trust. And on the other hand, uh, though getting more close to the United States, South Korea still hasn't given up the idea of convincing China to push North Korea returning to dialogue. With the new space unit between South Korean forces and the U.S., um, this includes capabilities of monitoring Chinese missile activity. Do you feel the UN administration is preparing for potential repercussions from China? The South Korea government is still maintaining a stance or an attitude not to trigger China's anger. And it is because uh, China is still, uh, it, he, China is still South Korea's uh, biggest economic partner, charging around 25% on South Korea's import and export. And especially, I need to mention, many raw materials which used by South Korea producing automobiles and semiconductors are from China, with many of the items charging over 90%. That means South Korea's economy is relying on China a lot, which the current conservative Yoon so government are not able to ignore unless he successfully reduces the economy re uh, rely. So even President Yoon, who used to criticize the former Moon Jae-in regime, for being too friendly or too pro-China, even mentioning that most of the people, um, especially the young generation in South Korea, hate China. After he's been elected, his government is now very cautious on China. Given the economic reliance Korea has on China, as you mentioned, do you feel South Korea could in any way increase its role in maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait? Extremely difficult. The first reason will be the, the economic rely toward China, as I just mentioned. And the second reason is that this is still uh, President Yoon's beginning. No matter President Yoon dislikes China, no matter how China feels unsafe and keeps on his toes when um, seeing South Korea now switching more to the United States, since it's President Yoon's first year in office, I think um, both President Xi Jinping and uh, President Yoon so -gyo will spend at least one year to find out if they can improve the, the mutual relation, um, maybe not as good as before the 2015, but at least in some extent. And think about it, if now China takes an aggressive attitude or impress more re revenges or sanctions on South Korea, uh, he will immediately make South Korea switch, into, uh, switch uh, to the United States and Japan more, which is totally not good for Beijing himself. So it will be, extremely difficult to see South Korea actively help maintain the peace in the Taiwan Strait. And indeed, over the, the past months, I've directly asked several UN's um, officials, including the foreign minister, what is the attitude of South Korea uh, about the Taiwan Strait issue and which position will South Korea choose if China invades Taiwan? Um, they all rejected to, uh, to um, answer me directly, only saying that in the very uh, genetic level that South Korea cares about the safety and the peace of Taiwan Strait the most. But I think comparing to the former uh, Moon Jae-in regime, uh, President Yoon seems to show more interest in Taiwan. And as I know, as uh, my resources told me, there was a secret visiting and a meeting between South Korean and Taiwanese officials in Seoul around uh, November last year. And I think not only the unofficial ones, but also this kind of non-public meeting and interactions between the two countries might be held more frequently than the former regime. You just heard from Yang Qianhao speak to Raf about increased military ties with the U.S. and how South Korea is navigating its relationship with China. So now we will keep talking about the geopolitics risk of the year among Asian area. So Ur Kaishi, we are curious uh, to see that actually Chinese President Xi Jinping met with President Yun of South Korea in Bali in mid November last year. So um, how, how, how would you see South Korea is going to balancing on the superpowers, the US and China to gain their position among Asia? I think it is the hardest question for every South Korean leaders when they come into the position. Yeah. How do they balance? So uh, I like what uh, uh, Vincent just mentioned. I think South Korea will come more and more closely in to understand that the world is dividing into two camps. Mm -hmm. And then the readiness of the alliance between 
uh, democracies is increasing. Uh, when you know, like, while Taiwan is changing its military structure, uh, while Japan have been advocating for alliances between U.S. and Taiwan for the past many years, South Korea will be uh, uh, thinking this million-dollar question for them: How do we balance between U.S. and China more and more? More likely, they will serve, do the lip services to the uh, China to ma maintain their economic interests while they're increasing their military cooperation with the United States. Uh, well, although Taiwan and South Korea does not have much of a, of a direct link in the cooperation, but in the, in the future, when U.S. Uh, presence is be increasing in the region, mm -hmm. mostly militarily, that increase, uh, that increasing of the military presence will in inevitably bring Taiwan and Japan into this this uh, uh, this alliances. So uh, China and North Korea is making their enemies united, like where they. So and then the world is also getting into a good understanding of the importance of this democratic alliances, especially after Russia invasion of Ukraine. So uh, 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 the right message has always been the most important lesson that we learned from this uh, Russian invasion of, uh, of, uh, uh, to, to, to Ukraine, that we did not, the world failed to send the right message to Putin that lead to this invasion. So from now on, we're going to send the right message. That's the, uh, that's the lesson that the Western world came up. And then that lesson is deterioration. That's it, clear, very clear. How about you, Vincent? Do you have anything to, to add on? Well, I think it's this. I think, I think South Korea previously, like I said earlier, is, has been focused on one threat and one threat alone. And if they've done everything at their disposal to try to contain that one threat, irrespective of whether it was cooperation with China, um, friendlier relations with the CCP and so forth. And, and at, the, at one point in time, you deserve to really cut your losses. I mean, that, that, that hasn't really contributed to this idea of regional peace. And I think Yoon is moving in that direction. Um, I mean, you can't pretend to solve problems when you have a record high of missile launches against you and your vicinity. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. And we have to understand there's also public opinion dimension to this. I mean, if you look at public opinion polls in South Korea, I mean, the country that, that they view as, you know, a destabilizing actor is China. And the country that, you know, they, they, they tend not to welcome is China. Mm -hmm. And so, and, you know, all of this did not come naturally. And, and, and it came as a result of increased tensions. It came as a result of, I think, public's perception of what China is doing in North Korea. It came as a result uh, of uh, uh, Chinese economic actions against South Korea and so forth. And so, you know, at, at, at some point in time, I, I think uh, what we will see is, number one, a growing recognition that China threatens us all. Okay. Like, it's, it's, it, it's not just a threat focused on Taiwan. I, I'll give you one worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. If Taiwan were to fall to the CCP, I mean, it becomes very, very difficult to imagine this U.S. security architecture holding up in that case. I mean, that security architecture will be completely shattered. Japan and Korea would have to reforge a new security architecture based on what they believe will provide security at the time. And I think it's going to be vastly different from the one we see today. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think South Korea should have that recognition one day, which is that China is a threat to us all. Number two is that this idea that you can't really buy yourself out of a threat by appeasing another authoritarian actor. And so the idea that North Korea and China are actually connected at the hip and that nothing you do with China will deter themselves because having an increasing bellicose North Korea is completely within China's own national interests. Okay. And you're not going to deter themselves away from pursuing that national interest. So from that respect, I, I do think that those two trends will become more and more apparent over time. Mm -hmm. So when do you see that coming? Because we've seen um, North Korea's, um, excuse me, um, South Korea's um, defense paper come out to s mention Taiwan, but there's only one line on that. And there seems that President Yoon is still very um, cautious in the way that he presents Taiwan. Do you feel that that reckoning will come soon? And even earlier last year, he was on leave, so he wouldn't be able to meet Nancy Pelosi, the speakers, right? I, I think I think there's two things. First of all, we're going to look at the U.S. play an increasing role in kind of mm -hmm. um, encouraging them as a major security partner to move in that direction. And we're seeing that already. I mean, we saw this through 
uh, the, the, the defense and foreign minister talks that they held with the U.S. counterparts. We've seen this in kind of statements that have come out through multilateral agencies and so forth. So that's the first part. The second part, I think every government, every administration in the world, including ours, uh, normally ha tries to pursue this idea of a reset in China relations. Like they tend to think that things will change yeah. and that they have the ability to change. We saw this during Obama, we saw this during Trump. We saw this to a certain tiny, tiny extent through Biden, not as apparent as his predecessors, but including here in Taiwan, including South Korea. Mm -hmm. And so I think every administration will come in with optimism that hopefully by having a different style of diplomacy, China's gonna change. China is not going to change. And so I think every country wakes up and finds out that cold, hard reality, I think, sooner rather than later. That's a great point you mentioned. Um, do you feel that <laughs> yeah. um, things will change with um, Chai's new message as we've seen President Tsai in her New Year's speech? Yes, of course, the pressure always works uh, when, when come to China, when come to authoritarian regime. But the, the problem in the last 30 years, there have been a vacuum of that pressure. Mm -hmm. The world have been appeasing them and trying to hope with this appeasement policy that they can achieve something. And then now, I think United States is leading, have come around and realized, no, that's not going to work. But how do you take President Tsai's New Year message? It seemed to be slightly an olive branch like to China. sending the message to be more But peaceful. also much stronger uh, uh, stand on de defending democracy. Okay. That, that's, that part is, that's the more important part of President Tsai's New Year's uh, speech that we will defend, we will not, uh, the message should be to China that we will not, uh, uh, we will not surrender, we will not submit under pressure. Mm -hmm. That's the mo most important uh, message of the president's speech in the New Year's. And then that is also a clear indication of the forming of the alliances. Uh, Taiwan under direct threat uh, of, uh, of China's military aggression have long understood Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that you cannot win over, uh, uh, you know, your, your oppressor's uh, leniency by appeasing it. So that's why, I, I mean, the, the, when, when KMT uh, lost many, uh, won uh, every major election in the past for the, for the uh, uh, general election and then the parliament, that also uh, sent a clear signal that the people of Taiwan have also come to that understanding. And then the United States, after many, many years, it took a businessman president to realize that their China deal is a bad deal. Mm -hmm. So they turned, and then you, when United States turned, Europe reluctantly or just slowly will follow. And Japan being in the front line, also just like Taiwan being uh, uh, understood it much earlier than the rest of the uh, uh, members of this alliances. Korea between I'm pretty sure they understand, They will come around and then they will understand it. And they probably already did, just under this very unique circumstances, they have to refrain from talking out loud. So that's probably also, it can explain that one line with Taiwan. They don't want to, uh, they don't want to agitate China. That, that we understand. But uh, they did mention Taiwan, so they did. you could see that as progress. Yeah. Your I do see that as a problem. I think we can, and we can see when the U.S. interference in the region and trying to build the anti-China military structure mm -hmm. among with United States and, and, and then with their allies in, in the region, which is us, South Korea, and, uh, and, uh, and Japan, and India. You know, so, so when these alliances, when United States finally increase its military structure, and then there's a clear, no ambiguity. It's just a very clear strategy that China is the enemy, and then we want to deter them from making any mistakes. We will not make our mistake again by sending a wrong uh, message to Putin, and then that made him believe that uh, he can get away with it. And this time, is no mistake. The, the, the message is going to be clear, crystal clear that, uh, that uh, uh, any of the military aggression that the China can think of will be considered not just against Taiwan, it will be considered uh, against United States-led democratic allies. I see. So we just talked about how China is one of the 2023's top geopolitical risks and ways countries in the region are managing its increased aggression while maintaining trade ties with it. Come up next, we'll hear from Rick Fisher, Senior Fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center, as he speaks to Rev on what Taiwan's construction reform means to its largest security ally, the U.S., and regional ally, Japan. Welcome back to the show. 
Let's now hear from Rick Fisher, Senior Fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center in Washington, D.C., on how Taiwan's extension of conscription back to one year from four months is bringing its arguably most important security allies, the U.S. and Japan, closer. Rick is a longtime security analyst and author of China's Military Modernization, Building for Regional and Global Reach. Let's take a look. President Tsai's decision to extend uh, the length of conscription for one year is largely viewed uh, in uh, Washington defense circles as a long overdue decision. Uh, Taiwan has the ability to defend itself. It has the ability to deter an existential threat from communist China. It simply has to stand up and mobilize its society. Uh, conscription is one step. Vastly increasing production of munitions and uh, weapons, especially missiles, is another step. But uh, in Washington, the move to extend conscription is viewed very positively. And the sooner that Taiwan can build a reserve component that is trained not just to use rifles, but to use anti-tank weapons and uh, demolition munitions, mines and such, all the better. Taiwan can prevent a Chinese communist attack. How do you believe the U.S. government is taking this, as we've seen the de facto U.S. embassy in Taiwan, the American Institute in Taiwan, come out right after President Tsai's announcement? For more than a decade, the United States government has been urging Taiwan quietly and sometimes not so quietly to do far more for its self-defense. The more Taiwan is mobilized, the more it is training recruits, the more that it is expanding its own weapons production, the easier it will be for the United States and Japan to assist Taiwan in the event the Chinese Communist Party makes the grave mistake of attacking Taiwan. You talked about Japan earlier and also the U.S. With this gesture, do you feel there will be substantial increased support for Taiwan? The more Taiwan contributes to its own self-defense, the greater the confidence will rise in Tokyo, in Washington to assist Taiwan in its self-defense. It is a mutually advantageous dynamic that Taiwan must promote and sustain. Yes, the more Taiwan takes steps in its own self-defense, the more confident leaders in Tokyo and Washington will be toward the goal of assisting Taiwan's defense, even up into and including combat with the People's Liberation Army. Taiwan is taking a step in its not just immediate self-defense, but in its larger and regional strategic self-defense by increasing its conscription time. Do you see comparisons with Ukraine as Ukraine's shown its self-determination to defend its homeland. Absolutely. Uh, nobody can defend Taiwan more than the Taiwanese themselves. If the United States had tactical nuclear artillery shells, it could deploy those to Taiwan if it so desired and halt immediately the prospect of any invasion of Taiwan. But we don't have those tactical nuclear artillery shells. And because of that, it is doubly, quadruply important for Taiwan to take steps such as extending its conscri conscription period in order to encourage its natural allies, Japan and the United States, to do more to help Taiwan. Taiwan has not yet approached a stage of mobilization that happened in the Ukraine 
after 2014. You just heard from Brig Fisher on how Taiwan's conscription extension is the clearest sign of its commitment to self-defense while gathering more allied support from the U.S. to Japan. So now moving on, we would like to focus on Taiwan's recent news that we extend to one year uh, from four months for the military service. So work has you, from your point of view, has this uh, has U.S. had any influence on this decision of to course, Taiwan? Of course, United and how close for the decision? Well, uh, not well. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the term from changing uh, uh, the uh, draft from four months to one year is the smaller part of the bigger military construction. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, basically, after this wave of uh, military reform, military structure reform of Taiwan. We will be able to mobilize about half a million well-trained men and women to face any military uh, aggression from China. And then, if we can, if we can promise that, if we can manage to, after two, one, two, two, three years, that we can uh, uh, manage to change, like all of the uh, 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 acting servicemen and then the reserve, uh, all went through like a one year of a, uh, sufficient training. Mm -hmm. uh, we will, they will not be just standing there and then uh, uh, doing the, the stabbing anymore, the pose, and then it was more like a show than a, and an actual training. So the, in the future, the one year training will be much more substantial. I think that's the uh, key point of the one, year, one year's training. My son was in the military. For, and then he was he served the four months, and okay. then he says, well, basically you can see that they are like a very different two part. The active uh, draft draftee and then the volunteers are very different. Taiwan's military power is uh, is is uh, formidable, but then at the same time, we have presented this four months draft thing. To, uh, it's a and then changing it back to one years is not only necessary, but it also send a much clearer message. So it's, yeah. uh, it's also a cl clear political move, I would yeah. say, and then the sending a stronger message to China and in the US. To sending the message to China is we're ready to fight. Sending the message we send to US is we are ready to uh, form the alliances. We are ready to, uh, to, uh, uh, to take the uh, risk, to, sorry, to take the sacrifice if necessary. Mm -hmm. That is, and then I think it's a very important message to our allies. If we let, we, we, if the, the four months term have kind of misled mm -hmm. to the world to, to think that we are we not, we don't want to lose, we don't want to take out any sacrifices ourselves. Mm -hmm. But when, after we saw the uh, 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 men and women in Ukraine defending their country, and then also... Uh, I, I, yeah, I, it was sending some message. Uh, the, yes, I, I think uh, the message itself is important, but the reform mm -hmm. with uh, 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 strong substance uh, is also going to, uh, in two years' time, we're going to re make our country ready, make our uh, armed force much more ready than, uh, than today. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, is the key point of this military reform. And then yeah. I think we should have a confidence uh, mm -hmm. to, to, our, to our defense force. This doesn't even include, you know, the um, militia that Robert Sow's group exactly. is planning on. Yes. And that could be like a few more million people. The cognitive uh, uh, warfare is, uh, that has been initiated long ago from the China to Taiwan already. Okay. They, that cognitive warfare is long started. This is telling, like, when we, if we invade, we're going to finish. We're going to finish the war within a day or two. That's, that's what they want to, they want Taiwanese people to be afraid and to give in. And then uh, that's cognitive uh, uh, warfare. And then uh, uh, Mr. Cao's uh, donation and then his movement, his movement, is also a very successful cognitive warfare and yeah. telling China that we're not buying your cognitive warfare. We have our own. We will defend ourselves. And then I think Ukraine, again, uh, have, uh, it's been, they have been fighting for almost a year now. They have strongly inspired our Taiwanese people. So we see the U.S. role for this uh, changing of the, of the system. But Vincent, what's the debate in, in, within the party? I'm curious about DPP's debate, especially after the election. 
Well, first of all, I, I served in <laughs> as a conscript between uh, 20, 2011 and 2012. Yeah, um, for a year, was, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think many people in my generation felt, to be frank, it was a waste of time. I mean, you didn't learn any real kind of military, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, tactics. You didn't. You, you had very limited exposure to, I think, real military training, and and a lot of time was just, you know, sweeping and you know, cleaning and and so forth. And so this idea of military reform isn't exactly new. And so I, I will say this: this this. Um, conscription reform has been a long time coming. Uh, it's the planning stage took about two and a half years. Yeah. And we're going to see another year before it's implemented. So we have about three full years to kind of study and work out the kinks. And so we won't work how you should talk, you know, about this length being just one component. That's absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot of different components to it. I mean, we're increasing pay, for example. So it's, it's roughly corresponding to our uh, minimum wage right now. Mm -hmm. So when I served, it was 6,000 NT. Yeah. It's going to be over 20K um, when I think it's reintroduced um, next year. Um, to a certain extent, training has been completely revamped. You know, gone are kind of these ideas that, for example, of bayonet training and all of these ideas that really have no substance or play today. And so it's just one component. There are many components to it. But I, I will say this. As we think about reserve reform, it is true that I think the U.S. has encouraged it. I do think the U.S. has a vested interest in seeing this being a successful reform. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's any secret at all that when politician, any politician from any party, goes to DC and meets with US policymakers, defense is probably the number one topic. And what are the steps Taiwan is taking to defend ourselves? What are the steps Taiwan will take to defend ourselves is a key point of any discussion. That's not a secret. And so I think that, I think this idea, and I really subscribe to it, that this is more than just a military reform. It's a political reform. Mm -hmm. It's a reform in a way of how we think about Taiwan's security. It's a reform in terms of our formerly our defense minister is going to um, LY exploration sessions and saying that Taiwan will hold on two weeks. That's absolutely the wrong attitude to take. I mean, the right attitude is we're going to hold on for as long as we need to hold on, yeah. and we're going to be responsible ultimately for our own self-defense. And so conscription, increasing that to one year, or, or you know, returning that to one year, helping um, have a more modernized training, um, forming this idea of not only the territorial defense forces, but also the reserves and engagement reforms on both of these, I think goes a long way to showing that we're serious about all of this and that Taiwan is going to be a tough nut to crack if China, you know, so chose one day to invade Taiwan. With that change in attitude, is that also why we're seeing more U.S. support for Taiwan's military as we've seen in the 2023 NDAA? Um, there, but there's also been talks of how um, grants turned into loans. If you could talk a bit about that. Sure. I mean, <laughs> well, you know, there's a saying in Chinese, and I think it's absolutely true, which is 天助自助者, which is that, you know, people help you if you help yourself.